Sir, I like that. I love it when they hide the scripture. All right, turn to the book of Genesis 11 with me this morning, please. Genesis chapter number 11. Genesis chapter number 11 and verse number 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain, the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach to heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad, upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, and that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore the name of it is Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Then what follows is a genealogy in Genesis chapter number 11 that brings you down to a man on this earth who was a, uh, who, chapter number 10 rather, look at the genealogies that bring you down to verse number 8, Genesis 10 and verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Father, bless this holy book now, and I pray, Heavenly Father, you'd open the hearts of the people to receive your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, Nimrod is the great-grandson of Noah. That's the only connection he has with Noah. His grandfather's name was Ham. In the book of Genesis, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. By reading the Word of God, you understand that God placed a curse upon the seed of Ham. When we go back and study the ancient history, we find that through Ham was disseminated this corrupt, perverted, occultic knowledge of not, not really of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but of a false God. And in Genesis chapter number 11, we have a tower that is built that it may reach into heaven. This tower is a mysterious thing, very, very mysterious. Nimrod is a contemporary of Abraham, which puts us back about 1,900 years before Christ. The word of God was not written down until Moses wrote it 1,400 years before Christ, which is the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So before the word of God was ever written down, Satan had already planted the seed of corruption, perversion, occultism into the human race. It started before the flood when the fallen angels came down and instructed men in rebellion against God. It came to its head when Nimrod led the world in a worldwide rebellion against God in Genesis chapter number 11. As I told you, I think it was last Sunday morning, it was after that, that God called Abram from Ur of the Chaldees to give to him the true knowledge of God and the revelation that we have today, which is called the scripture. The scripture was given to the people of Israel, to the Jew. To them was committed the oracles of God. But when you walk out of this building this morning into this world, you are going to be confronted with Nimrod and with the spirit of Nimrod 
and with the rebellion of Nimrod. You're going to be confronted with it and you're going to have to deal with what happened in Genesis chapter number 11. It is still moving apace. Nimrod was a rebel against God. And because of that, God Almighty had to call Abram from Ur of the Chaldees to give him the truth of where we are today. I'm going to preach a message to you this morning entitled CERN Revisited. If you'll remember a few months back, I brought a message on CERN, the Large Hadron Collider that is in Switzerland. It is 17 miles in circumference. It is the largest man-made machine on the face of this earth. On the purpose of it is a scientific endeavor to discover what can happen when you collide particles at almost the speed of light. The collider, this CERN, and CERN, this Large Hadron Collider, is frozen down on the inside to a temperature far below outer space. They are controlling it by magnets and move these particles at an enormous rate of speed and with an enormous amount of power that's involved in it. A lot of folks think, well, this has nothing to do with me, but when we begin to get into it this morning, I think you may be amazed at how much it has to do with you. This large Hadron Collider in Switzerland is something that is right now at this very moment, while we're in this auditorium, this preacher's preaching, it's working. And they intend to do some things with it. And this is not going to be public knowledge. What is for public knowledge and public consumption is one thing. But what they are doing, what they intend to do, their motive behind all of this is something else altogether. So you need to understand today when I bring a message like this that I'm not preaching a message from the viewpoint of a physicist. I'm not a physicist. If I tried to talk like a physicist, I'd make a fool out of myself. I'm a Baptist preacher. I'm a Bible believer, but I can read. And I read a lot. And I've read a lot of material, a lot of research into what's going on in CERN, Switzerland. And I want to give you some of that this morning because I believe firmly in my heart that we live in the last generation before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe we're on the precipice of his appearing. I believe he could come at any moment. And that coming of the Lord Jesus is what's called in the Bible the rapture of the church of God. It's a mystery revealed only to the apostle Paul, not to the other disciples. And so we need to be ready. We need to know. For the Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So CERN, Switzerland, you say, what's that got to do with Nimrod? Oh, they're closely connected. They're very closely connected. Listen carefully to what one researcher, Paul McGuire, said about this. He said, since ancient Babylon and the Tower of Babel, built by genetic Nephilim or God King Nimrod, the world has been secretly and increasingly controlled by secret societies that have access to this secret occult knowledge, technology, and science. For example, a collection of secret occult societies such as Thule, Vril, the Golden Dawn, the OTO put Adolf Hitler into power. The occult societies trained Hitler in the science of mind control and taught him how to put the masses in a hypnotic state when he gave speeches. These secret elites also taught him about the science of eugenics and how to breed a master race. The Third Reich was years ahead of the United States when it came to rocket technology and mind control. Some believe that German rocket scientists like Werner von Braun were given engineering blueprints for UFOs and other technologies which were telepathically received by the Vril maidens who were clairvoyants as far back as 1926. The scientific elite who rule over this world are in possession of highly advanced scientific technologies and knowledge and they fully understand the supernatural nature of this information and know of its origin in ancient Babylon. Now, I know it's a lot to digest in one message, but for just a moment, can you imagine that there is a group of people on this earth who know far, far more about what they're doing than the average man does, and that they are in control of what's happening right now in science falsely so-called. And what's happening in CERN, Switzerland, may very well be the foundation for opening the door to the Antichrist when he shows up, and he may be alive at this very moment. I believe he is. I believe in every generation since Christ 2,000 years ago, someone has lived who could qualify as the man of sin. And I believe that these forces and powers are coming together. They are controlling what's happening. 
Listen to what Paul McGuire says. This higher level knowledge is distributed selectively and in a highly compartmentalized manner so that even so-called upper level people such as presidents, senators, scientists, educators, heads of multinational corporations, cultural leaders, psychologists only have a tiny compartment of information. And so it goes. In the book of Genesis, we read the account of the Tower of Babel in ancient Babylon, which was headquarters for the world's first one world government, one world economic system, and one world religion. And there is no question about that. When you read the book of Genesis chapter number 11, you see that Nimrod was pulling the whole world together in a world religion, a world worship, a world economic system. In other words, world all over the world, not just located in some locale. He was looking at the whole world. Therefore, Nimrod becomes a type of the Antichrist. Now, there's a lot to be said about Nimrod. I don't have time this morning for that. But Nimrod was considered a God king. And being considered a God king, that he was a God man. Therefore, not thou the God man that we worship, the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan has his counterfeit in every religion. Think for a moment. Imagine the Lord Jesus Christ being lifted up out of Christianity and placed into Buddhism. Would he fit? Imagine the Lord Jesus Christ being lifted up out of Christianity and placed into Hinduism. Would he fit? Imagine the Lord Jesus Christ being lifted up out of Christianity and placed into the occult world, into the New Age sciences, and all of that. Oh, they've got a Christ, but he's not the Lord Jesus Christ of the Bible. If you are a truly born-again believer in Christ today, you know that the Lord Jesus Christ is unique from every person that has ever lived on the face of this earth. There was never none before him. There'll never be any after him. He's one of a kind. He is God Almighty manifest in flesh. He is the redeemer of all mankind that went to the cross and there shed his blood so that you and I could be saved. He died and was buried and he rose again on the third day from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father 40 days later and is seated now at the right hand of the majesty upon high. He will come again to this earth and when he comes again to this world, he will judge every God, every king, every spirit, every being, every creature, everything will be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is alone in his essence. He is alone in his identity. There's none like him. He's God manifest in the flesh. Now, that does not fit in Buddhism. Buddhism. That will not fit in Hinduism. That will not fit in Islam. They have a Christ. They've got a Jesus. But he is an absolute, completely different Jesus than the one you believe in. Don't ever let a Muslim tell you that they believe in Jesus. They do not. They believe that Jesus is a, is a Muslim. They believe that Jesus is not the Son of God. They do not believe that Jesus died on the cross in Islam. And they believe in Islam that when Jesus comes back, he will come back as a prophet, he will destroy the cross, tell Christians they're wrong, and confess that he is a Muslim and always has been. Friend, that is not the Lord Jesus Christ of the Bible. Now that's what they're teaching and that's what they're preaching. And so when I look at scripture, I must understand that you have Christ and you have an antichrist. You have the true Christ and you have a false Christ. You have the true Christ and a pseudo Christos. And that's exactly where we stand today. Your choice is simple. You either choose the true Christ or the false Christ, the real Jesus or a false Jesus, the real Holy Ghost or a false Holy Spirit. That's where we are. And so Mr. Uh, uh, this, this brother right here does his research and he does his research about, uh, about, the, about the Antichrist, Paul McGuire. He winds up by making this statement. He says that the source of knowledge from all occult secret societies throughout the ages, such as the priesthoods and mystery cults of ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome, the Rosicrucians, Illuminati, and many other groups, flows directly from the mystery religions of ancient Babylon. From the standpoint of Bible prophecy in the last days, mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, will rise again in the form of a global religious system and global economic system. And if you've read the book of Revelation, you are fully aware that Babylon, Babylon, Babylon is connected with the Antichrist. 
Babylon is connected with the end time. It's connected with the coming of the Lord Jesus. Babylon is connected with the curse on this earth. So we must be aware there is something going on that is preparing this earth for the coming of the Antichrist. Now there are those who understand physics. There are those who are well read in science. There are those who have PhDs that can break down everything that's going on in CERN, Switzerland. I can't do that, folks, but I can read what they say. And that's what I'm gonna give you now. I'm gonna give you for just a moment what they are observing about CERN, Switzerland, and the potential of what's happening there. So I'll do what I'm supposed to do, and I would like for you to listen to what I have to say. I don't know if you've ever heard of Timothy Alberino or not, but Timothy Alberino is a researcher, and I'm using his material about CERN, Switzerland. And here is what he says. He says that what's going on there may very well have to do with a time distortion and stargates. In plainer words, what they may be trying to do is to open a door into another dimension, whether it be space or time. I quoted Bertolucci to you, who was ahead of what's going on at CERN, Switzerland. Bertolucci said that we will open a door. And he said, we were going to open this door and we're going to send something through it. He said, but when we open this door, something may come through from the other side. We don't know. In plain words, we are playing with something that we do not know. And I ask you a question this morning. Maybe he knows what's going on. Maybe he understands what the elite are trying to do. Maybe not. But the bottom line is that they are in something that could have a profound potential for this whole earth and your life. There are reasons for gates. There are reasons for fences. There is a reason that God put cherubim to the tree of life with a flaming sword to keep the way to that tree. God will protect his people if you'll let him do that. But when you begin to tear down the walls and open the doors and open the gates, my dear friend, something could come through that gate that you have the least idea and are certainly not prepared for. When I say you, I'm talking about the average American and the average worldly citizen of this world that doesn't have a clue about where they are and what's happening. So he says time distortion and stargates. He says strangelets are may very well be in the, mo in the, in the mix at CERN, produced from a quark gluon plasma soup, sometimes generated after high energy particle collisions. Strangelets are the most explosive substance in the known universe. These are not theoretical. He says strangelets do exist and have been confirmed to exist at the Brookhaven National Laboratory located in Long Island, New York. The potential gains of this endeavor for the military industrial complex are self-evident. They, they are working with explosives that would make an atomic bomb look like a firecracker. How many of you have ever heard of a 50 megaton uh, hydrogen bomb. In Hiroshima and Nagasaki, when they dropped those two bombs in August 1945, first in Hiroshima, then in Nagasaki, they were atomic bombs. A 50 megaton hydrogen bomb is so much more powerful than an atomic bomb that, dear friend, it takes an atomic bomb to detonate a hydrogen bomb. Think about that for a minute. Think about the potential of destruction that man has in his hands right now. And now think about something that is so miniature and so small that men are beginning to step on the frontier of explosives that they didn't even know existed. The Bible tells me plainly that except those days should be shortened, no flesh should be left alive. The Bible says that heart, men's hearts are going to fail them for fear of those things that are coming upon the earth. Can you imagine living in a scientific world that at any moment could literally be vaporized? Imagine living in a scientific world where the depths of hell are opened up and from the depths of hell beings, spirit beings come out upon this earth and move about as it says in Revelation chapter number nine. Can you imagine living in a world where men will plead for death to come and death will flee from them? You say, preacher, you're trying to scare me. No, I'm just quoting scripture. If you read the Bible and believe it, it'll scare you. If you read the book of Revelation and believe what you're reading, you'll know that it doesn't turn out good 
it turns out bad for planet Earth. And the only hope for planet Earth is when I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Everything I read in the scripture points to the fact that everything gets worse and worse and worse until the light comes, until the glory comes, until the Savior comes. In other, in other words, all of a sudden, in the, face of, in, a, in the face of catastrophe, in the face of death, in the face of men dying, in the face of the most horrible that you could ever imagine, all of a sudden, the heavens open and Christ comes back. That's my hope. That's my hope. My blessed hope is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say now, preacher, you mean by that that you don't put much stock in men? You got me right. You say by that, preacher, you don't believe that men are going to solve the problem. No, they're going to, they are the problem. <laughs> they're going to make the problem worse. You say the only problem solver is the Lord Jesus Christ. Particle beam weapons. Ever heard of that one? A directed beam of high energy subatomic particles moving at extreme velocity such as would be produced at LCH or the Large Hadron Collider, is capable of obliterating, obliterating matter at the molecular level. Particle beam weapons are already on the battlefield, especially in black ops warfare, and the research of CERN will certainly expand and refine their military application. It's almost as if what's going on at CERN is preparing the world for the biggest war, the biggest war that it's ever known. It's preparing to be able to kill millions, yea, billions of people from the face of the earth to wipe them away. The elite have already told people, if you'll listen to them, they've already said we need to get rid of most of the population of this earth. Those people that hug trees and worship the green movement, they want you to understand that you are expendable and you really don't have any business being here. They had rather have a blade of grass than a baby crying. They had rather have a tree than a home with a mom and a dad and a child. They, my friend, classify you. They're the pro they, they are the logical progression of Darwin. They classify you as nothing but a piece of meat that needs to be gotten rid of. You're nothing, nothing, nothing. Therefore, these people, self-appointed gurus, the anointed of mankind, my friend, they are so far above you that it's not funny. They're going to decide whether you live or whether you die. And they've already made that decision. World War III, friend, is just around the corner. And they're going to kill. Believe me. Did you know that at CERN, Switzerland, they're doing DNA sequencing? What is the purpose of that? Well, the human genome was charted. That was quite a job. If you've been listening to anything they say on television, they said there was a time in the not too distant past when it took them something like 7 to 14 days to do a, to do a, to, to chart a genome. I forget exactly the terminology involved in it. It took them something like two weeks to do that. They say now they do 100 a day. They've come a long way, haven't they? So what's that got to do with anything? Maybe they want to create a monster. Maybe they're dealing with the, D, the DNA structure, the code of life, and they want to create monster men. Maybe they want to put them on this earth. Maybe they got something going there. Then there are those theoretical physicists who are really worried about CERN because they feel like that they're opening Pandora's box and one of their fears is a black hole. A black hole is a theoretical thing. They have never proven that a black hole exists. But listen to this. Perhaps the greatest fear among theoretical physicists concerning CERN is that it might create uncontrolled, uncontainable miniature black holes that could descend to the core of the other planet and literally devour it from within. It is important to note that black holes are only theoretical constructs and have never been proven to exist. Black holes were first discovered as purely mathematical solutions of Einstein's field equations and are not necessary in Tesla's electric universe model. To date, black holes are science fiction, but they may exist. There may be, there may be truth to them. And then there's the matter of anti-matter anti weapons. Unlike black holes, antimatter is not theoretical. This is another explosive, another very powerful explosive that even just as much as a, a small gram or a grain has the, uh, the explosive potential that is way beyond human comprehension and imagination. Now that you've looked at the scientific part of it, and it's moving right now, it's getting ready, I want you to think about the religious part 
of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the religious aspect to it. When you come to Temple Baptist Church, you come in here week after week after week, you hear me get up and preach. My message is simple and plain. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. He's coming again. The church is here to glorify him. And we pray and, and preach and at that, pray that God will save people. And that's what we're here for, as a witness and a testimony to the light. But folks, there's a lot of religion out there today that calls itself Christianity that is far, far from that. I've told you about Mount Graham in Arizona. Mount Graham in Arizona has a huge binocular telescope. And with that telescope, this Mount Graham, there's a Roman Catholic observatory. That Roman Catholic observatory has an instrument in it called Lucifer. Now of all things, they want to call it Lucifer. Here they are gazing off into the heavens. Now they're beginning to tell people to look for something that may very well show up in the very near future. Say, what is that preacher? Extraterrestrials from outer space. They are sending the message out to people on earth that there, are, there, there may very well be something out there and it's going to come down here to where you are. Now that was in the realm of science fiction and only loons and crazies ever believed in ETs uh, 50, 60, 75 years ago. But now the scientific community is embracing the idea of extraterrestrials. The reason they are is because they have gotten rid of biological evolution. Though they won't tell you that, they have literally turned from it and they're turning to something greater because they know there's more to man than something that came out crawling up on a, on a, on a beach like a tadpole. They understand that mankind is something special and unique. They understand, therefore, that men are here for a reason. So they look up into the heavens. E.T. is an extraterrestrial. The Vatican has come out and said there may very well be extraterrestrials up there. Now, friend, let me tell you something this morning. The only extraterrestrial is Satan as a great red dragon that's right above the atmosphere of this earth. And we have demonic spirits that are around this earth. They're everywhere. Demons are all over the place. And these demons masquerade as E.T., as ghosts, as, as all kinds of, of supernatural things. These demonic spirits are real. Make no mistake about it. They are very real. No doubt about that. But what you have to do is stick with the Bible or you'll be deceived today and drawn off of the, of, of the truth and drawn out here in, into la-la land. Now, here's what they're saying to people. They're saying that E.T. is on the way. Our image of God, one says, will have to change if evidence of alien life on Mars is confirmed. A Vatican astron astronomer told the world's largest general science meeting. The modern concept of an anthropocentric God, that's just a big word that simply means a God that is associated or concerned about man being the center of his relationship. That's what that means. The modern concept of that kind of God may have to evolve into a broader entity to take account of the insights of any intelligent alien culture, said Dr. Christopher Corbelly, a British vice director of the Vatican Observatory. Now listen to this statement. While Christ is the first and the last word, the Alpha and the Omega spoken to humanity, it is not necessarily the only word spoken to the entire universe. Did you get the way they twisted that? Did you get a hold of that? In plain words, the Bible is for you, human beings. And it's only relative in that sense. But when the creator, as they call him, spoke, he may very well have spoken in a higher sense to a higher creation than you are. Are you ready for the Antichrist? In a statement before the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, Pope Francis endorsed the view that extraterrestrial life, which he refers to as beings of the universe, has evolved in ways that is consistent with the plans of God the Creator. He explained how the Catholic Church views the Big Bang and evolution as scientific processes underpinned by the plan of the Creator. Boy, so they have bought hook, line, and sinker into the idea of evolution. As a matter of fact, this new Pope, Francis, has been speaking quite a bit since he went into office. Here's what he said at St. Patrick's Cathedral. He made this statement. The Pope, the self-proclaimed vicar of Christ, preached a message, and here's what he said. He said, we need to remember 
that we are followers of Jesus Christ and his life, humanly speaking, ended in failure, the failure of the cross. Now digest that for a moment. This man told you when the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross that it was a failure. Now I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But listen to this. First of all, Pope Francis gave a shout out to his Muslim brothers and sisters. Now listen. When he said this, I would like to express two sentiments from my Muslim brothers and sisters. Firstly, my greetings as they celebrate the Feast of Sacrifice. In case he doesn't know, Islam clearly teaches that their God, Allah, has no son. Not at all. So for a Christian to be a spiritual brother or sister with a Muslim is impossible. How many agree with that? The Quran boldly declares that Allah has no son. Surah 19, 35 and 36. It is not befitting for Allah to take a son. Exalted is he. When he decrees an affair, he only says it be and it is. So let me break it down in simple terminology. The Pope said that the cross was a failure. The Pope said that the Muslim was his brother and sister. The Muslim teaches that the cross will be destroyed when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. He will not come back as your Lord Jesus Christ. He will come back as a Muslim prophet. And when he comes back, he will destroy the cross. He will break the cross. I can see a direct connection between what Pope Francis is saying about the cross being a failure and how, therefore the Muslim can accept that from this Pope. Therefore he is reaching out to the Muslims to create this one world religion. That is the largest group outside of so-called Christianity on the face of this earth. Various figures are given. One figure says that there, are, there is 1 billion, 300, 400, 500 million Muslims on planet earth. One figure says that there are 1 billion, 300, 400, 500, 600 million Christians on planet earth. A lot of people take what Pope Francis says as gospel. They believe that this man speaks as the voice of God. What this man is doing now is this. He is saying that there are ETs, extraterrestrials. He is saying that the gospel that you've got in your hand, the Bible, the Old Testament, that talks about Jehovah is for, is for simple-minded people. That he is much greater than the Old Testament God. That's exactly what occultism teaches. I've told you that time and time and time again. He is teaching down that Christ failed at the cross at Calvary. It was a complete failure. If that was a failure, I'd like to know who's going to show me success. It sure ain't coming from the Roman Catholic Church. And let me say this, if you're a Catholic, you'd better think long and hard about belonging to a church if it endorses the idea that the cross is a failure. You are no Christian in any sense of the word whatsoever. Take that and think about what I just said. If you deny the efficacy of the cross of Christ where he died on the cross and shed his blood for you, you are no Christian. I don't care whose church you belong to, you miss the boat completely. But he's making, he's outreaching to the Muslim. He's by saying that the cross is a failure. He's saying, I'm not about the cross. He's saying, I'm about unity. I'm about religion. I'm about the great spirit of the universe. I'm about bringing us all together. That's the message of the Pope. My dear friend, can you be a Christian and believe that garbage? You know what about the cross? Do you know the Bible says there's something about the cross that's unique? Listen to what the scripture says about the cross. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. Amen. The power of God and a failure of God. Which one is it? Is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ the power of God or is it the failure of God? Did God fail at Calvary or is that the power of God? And I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this right now. I don't care who you are, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what kind of life you've lived. 
If you come to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and come to the blood that was shed at that cross and get on your knees before that cross, that blood will wash your sins away and God will save you by the power of the cross. I'll tell you one thing. Every demon in hell knows the power of the cross. They know the power of the blood. And let me tell you something, folks. The blood was shed at the cross. It was the cross of Christ. Shall he take up his cross? Yes, he took it up. And when he went to the tree, the Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Where was he in Christ reconciling the world unto himself? At the cross at Calvary. The apostle says again in Galatians chapter number 6 and verse 14, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me, and I unto the world. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is a fence. It's a wall. It's a dividing line. It separates believers from non-believers. Now, folks, let me tell you what I believe about the cross. I believe the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ represents the supreme sacrifice of all mankind. It can't get any better than that. That is love written, in the, written my friend, for eternity to see. It was at the cross of Calvary that I glory in the greatness, the glory, the grace, the mercy, the generosity of Almighty God toward me and toward you. So the apostle says in Galatians chapter number six, I will glory only in the cross. In Colossians 1.20 he said, and having made peace through the blood of the cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So the apostle Paul says that peace was made at the cross of Christ. Now, if it's a failure, what kind of peace are we talking about? If it's a failure, why is the apostle Paul glorying in it? Why would you think that the cross of Christ is a failure? Now, just for a moment, let's look at the Pope's theology. Look at his thinking. What would cause a man to say that the cross of Jesus was a failure? Now, I'll tell you what it, what it means, what it implies. Clearly this morning, what preacher? It implies some future event. It implies something that's got to take place up on down the road. If the cross at Calvary, where the Lord Jesus went to the tree, shed his blood so you could be saved and I could be saved, is a failure, then when will he succeed? When will he not fail? That's what he's pointing you to. He's pointing you to a future event that will become your salvation, a future savior that will be the savior and redeemer of mankind. And believe me, it is not the Lord Jesus Christ that he's going to point you toward. And then finally, the Bible said in Colossians 2, verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. How in the world could he nail all the condemnation and judgment against me? How could he nail it to a failure? He nailed it to the tree. He became a curse on the tree. He became the Lamb of God on the tree. It was there that showed his absolute obedience and yielded himself unto the Father on the tree. A failure? I would, I, I would find it hard to come into this church and get up before you and tell you that what Christ did at the cross is a failure. I remember about 30 years ago, Reverend Moon, how many's ever heard of him? He was a South Korean pastor, evangelist, whatever. He started a whole movement called Moonies. And here's what that man taught. He taught, he, Moon, was the new Messiah, a Messiah, a savior based on the fact that he said that when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, he was a failure. He taught that to people. Do you understand the connection? If Moon can build upon his reputation and say he is a savior based upon the fact that Christ failed 2,000 years ago, then when a pope gets up and says that at the cross, the cross was a failure. He's preparing you for something down the road. And I want to tell you from my heart, just a gut feeling, there is no way that what he's preparing you for is good. 
No way. No way. But it is very scary. Take him. Take CERN. Take this stuff that's happening right now and all put it together. And you, the only conclusion you can come to is it can't go much longer. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. We are living in the generation, blessed of all generations. Somebody alive in this room this morning will more than likely see the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I may not see it in my few short years on this earth. God may call me home. I may, I may lay down tonight and never get up again in this world. I'm not worried about it. But I'll tell you something. We've got little ones in here. We've got young ones in here. I do not believe it will be that long before he comes back. How many of you in this house today agree with this preacher? There's no way it can continue on. It can't keep going. It can't keep going. There's no way. It just cannot keep going. Are you ready? Are you ready? He said, in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. If you laid your head down on the bed tonight and never woke up in this world again, would you be ready? Would you be ready? That's his peace he gives you. Not as the world giveth, give I thee. He said, my peace. Are you ready? Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Father, in thy holy name, Lord, I preach what you put on my heart. Delivered the message to the people. I pray they'd take it to heart now. I pray they'd think about this stuff. This, 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 this heavy scientific stuff that's going on at CERN has so much potential into a, an occult, wicked world what these people are doing over there. Lord, and that with this Pope who's working night and day to bring in a one world religion. What do we need? How much more do we need? What do we need to see? Your coming must be soon. In thy name we pray, in Jesus' name, and for Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Let's stand up.